live now. No. Live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Launch No Code podcast. My name's Natalie, and I'll be your host today. With me, I have Sarah, an epic no code maker, automator, and the founder of Podcast Ops. Hi, Sarah. How are you doing? Hi, Natalie. I'm great. Thanks for having me. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. You know, thanks so much for joining me. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed a couple of weeks ago going on one of your podcasts as well. So thanks for having me. And I'm just excited to have you here so we can go a little bit deeper into you, your story and how you launch no code. So Yes, I'm excited to share. <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to start with your kind of like no code origin story. Um, just a brief idea of like, how did you actually find this no code space? What brought you here? Yeah, my story, I think, is a lot like other folks who are entering the space. I didn't even know what no code was. I was using Webflow. I've been using Webflow since uh, 2019 and was building that out and kind of joined Twitter over the summer of 2020 and all of a sudden kept seeing this word no code pop up. I'm like, what the heck? And uh, yeah, just kind of fell backwards into it, but really was launched in the community when I joined MakerPad in September. Uh, they had a T30 challenge and that's where I built my first product and really was introduced to this whole world of no code and all the amazing people in it. So when you say T30, what do you mean? <laughs> Yeah, it was this 30 day challenge that they held over the month of September to build a product. So uh, we're both in Launch MBA, very similar concept, right? That you're launching a product every month. And this was really nice because it was a, a cohort of people going through it. You had kind of accountability sessions. And so I was able to build my first no code product. Didn't make any money, didn't go anywhere. <laughs> uh, but it was version one of helping creatives, which I've recently relaunched. So it was nice because it got me really used to working with a lot of different tools and interacting with the community and really seeing the power of no code come to life. Awesome. So you mentioned that you started with Webflow. Was that the only mm -hmm. product that you started with? What sort of other tools really got you into the space? Yeah, Webflow was really what got me started, uh, I think, because I have a design background and I, I was not real happy with some of the other design tools out there. I just really enjoyed Webflow and all that you could do with it very quickly. Um, so I really dove into Webflow headfirst, and it wasn't until last year that I found the other tools. Um, so I, my usual stack, and maybe we're going to ask this later, but I'll give a preemptive. My usual stack is Webflow, Airtable, and then an automation tool. So uh, either Integromat or Zapier are the two go-tos that I use. And I mm -hmm. tend to use that for pretty much everything. Uh, with my design stuff, I use Figma. Still not sure if that's considered a no-code tool, but <laughs> um, and then if you're going to add in membership, sometimes I do member stack or member space or outside. It just depends on what project you're building. Mm. Well, that's great. I mean, I think in the space there's so many tools now, and I think you know, yeah, it's quite difficult to go deep on all of them. So. Mm -hmm. In terms of your selection criteria, so of course, Webflow you decided on because, you know, that that's what you find good as a designer and you have the design skills. Now, other choices like Airtable and some of the automation stuff. So what is it that you like about Airtable? Why do you use it? What are the sort of use cases that you've used it for? Yeah, so Airtable I've used for so many different things. I actually started with Notion and I do still use Notion. Um, and I just really like organization. And for me, Airtable has so many extra organization capabilities that I can't do in some other tools like Notion. Uh, at least my brain tells me I can't do them in there. I'm pretty sure I can. But again, I think it's just one of those that when you find a tool that you click with, you tend to kind of dive in. So I've used Airtable for, uh, you know, to house my own CRM, to run my entire podcast, actually both of them, and built podcast ops on top of it. It's how I organize all of my guest information, break down show notes, transcriptions, um, you know, where I house everything and use automation to tie it together with Webflow. And the flexibility that's there and just all the different tables you can build and formulas and they've added so many web hooks and things now that you can really do a lot within Airtable, which I think is why I find it so enjoyable. Um, mm. Yeah, it just offers a lot of flexibility and now all of these cool tools being built on top of it, like softer, uh, you know, that you can launch a website right from there is pretty amazing. So I think I just really like it for its flexibility and the data capabilities behind it. 
Um, mm. It houses all the data for helping creatives and the community finder portion that I've built from that. And I, it's tough for no coders. I think once you get hooked on one to switch to something else, we're a tough sell. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of a tricky one, really, because Airtable has definitely got that ecosystem like built up around mm -hmm. it. I suppose my next question related to Airtable would be, where would you recommend people go to go deep on Airtable? Because I think it's really easy to kind of like start building the tables, adding the fields, all those things, mm -hmm. but you know, then when you want to start becoming sophisticated and actually thinking like, what, how far can I push this? Like, do you right. have any recommendations on where people should go to, to learn about that? Yeah. So I actually follow Aaron of Automate All The Things. So shout out to Aaron if he's watching. He does amazing things with Airtable and his stream, <laughs> he has weekly streams and just so much information around what you can do with Airtable. And like every no code tool, I always tell people just dive in and start playing with it. You really don't know what you can do with it and how it's going to meet your needs. Looking at templates, those are a good starting point. But until you dive in and actually play with it, you're never going to know the power and how it really best suits you. And there have been tools that I touch and I'm like, you know what, I, this is not for me. Um, you know, or I watch a video and decide this is probably a little bit too detailed. I look at the price tag and say, I could never afford to pay for that per month. So I'm not even going to bother. You know, um, mm -hmm. it's just one of those things that it's very individual, but I think hands-on is really the best way to go about it. So talking about prices of stacks and things like that, do you think maybe that might have an effect on the stacks that you choose to build your products? Because I know for me, I have a subscription with MailerLite, for example, and now any automated email flow, I'm like, well, I already have a subscription with them. So it makes sense for them to be in my stack. I don't really have much of a limit for that. Yeah. Do you think that's an influence on you sticking with some of your tools? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I, I think I've seen a lot of threads going around on Twitter recently about, you know, you shouldn't be building no code tools for no coders because we don't have the money to pay for all of them. We're not your target audience. Um, yes, I build with Webflow because I have Webflow plan. <laughs> now to add hosting, it it is additional for each one. But um, one, I'm comfortable with the product and two, Yes, that's where my money is already going. So I'm going to continue to spend there. Um, same thing with Airtable. I think because they keep adding functionality that's already built in and it's already a per month cost for me, that's really beneficial. Uh, when it comes to automation tools, it's tough because I I really, <laughs> I like both of them equally. I really like Integromat and Zapier for the different things that they do. So I have a soft spot for that. But yeah, when I'm evaluating new tools, price is the first thing I look at. Um, yeah. I just can't afford to buy all the things that I want to run. I'd pay hundreds of dollars a month to have every tool that I want. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you should say that no code makers are not necessarily the the target market for the tools or mm -hmm. people shouldn't make it for them. From kind of a marketing perspective, actually, the no code maker creator like group or audience of people is actually a very good early adopter or innovator audience to build traction mm -hmm. and vi virality mm -hmm. for tools. Yes. So I would sort of go ahead and say that, you know, it might be the first market where, you know, founders can actually go and test their no code tools and actually like mm -hmm. get people to break them who will try their hardest to break everything mm -hmm. and then make tons of stuff, which then gives them those testimonials because we know how important social proof is and yes. maybe that's the way that we should start looking at this no code community like we are the community that's going to put your tools to the test and you know maybe that's a way of them getting into smes and larger enterprises yes yeah i think you're spot on there uh you know marketing is not my strong suit <laughs> i'm working on it Natalie. <laughs> uh, but yes i i wholly believe that this community is great at validating but i mean you really do need to know your audience we can certainly validate for you whether or not it works but if it's meeting the needs of the people that you're focusing towards <laughs> i mean maybe we can yeah. definitely poke holes in the product and let you know what's not going right and give you a lot of really great valuable feedback uh, yes, there's a huge benefit there. But in terms of like, I should be building stuff for the no code space. Um, well, the no code makers like myself, you know, like if your target audience is me, I can't afford to pay for everything you're throwing at me. It's just not realistic. <laughs> yeah. So just give us more free stuff and then we'll try yeah. it and then we'll break I mean, it and then sure. we'll tell you how to make it better. That's so. right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but yeah, I think that's that's a great point. So like we've really kind of covered like the tools you use and just some of your thoughts around like pricing and options and choices. So now I'm kind of like really interested to dive a little bit more into some of the the products that you've launched. And I mean, for me, the first investment that I made in in you was um, podcast ops. And I'm quite interested to learn a little bit more about like how that's gone for you. Like, so do you want to share? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yes. Open book. Uh, Podcast Ops. Yes. That was my first launched paid product. So Podcast Ops was essentially built as a automating toolkit <laughs> um, to help break down the published podcast content for your online audience. And what I did was use an Airtable base as the data warehouse for all of that and put together a Webflow template for the website, package that in there, and then did some tutorials around how to automate it using either Zapier or Integromat. Um, so pre-launch went better than I expected. I had six people order pre-launch. I was hoping for 10, uh, being my first paid product and knowing that I was not fantastic at pre-launch marketing and that this was kind of the first time that I was entering that paid space and very different from the other things I had built previously. Um, you know, I didn't go in with like super lofty goals. So I was thrilled when I had six pre-orders. I've had one order since uh, and been working this month on marketing and kind of tailoring the messaging. Like many makers, I think we really struggle with marketing when it comes to our tools. We like to build more than we like to sell it. <laughs> so mm. still working at that and tailoring the messaging. Um, I think it's a solid product and I think it's really great if you are doing all self-publishing and self-hosting um, and I say that with a grain of salt because, of course, you're using a platform to host your uh, RSS feed for your podcast. But in terms of all the editing and, you know, getting guests arranged and setting everything up, this helps you with all that organization. And then once it's published, it helps you kind of break it down into segments for a newsletter or a blog or to tweet out all of those things. So uh, yeah. I think it went a lot better than I expected it to. But it definitely burnt me out. I took on too much. Um, I should have released one template instead of three, uh, you know, done a template or a video, not both. So lots of learning lessons in that particular journey. <laughs> I won't be repeating. Yeah. I, and I think I'm not quite sure if there's ever a launch that doesn't push you to the edge a little bit. I, yeah. I think to be somebody who launches no code, no code and actually pushes stuff out and gets people to pay for it, you know, it's not it's not as easy as people sometimes make it look. Oh no, not at all. It's very difficult. And I, I think we need to talk a bit more about that from a transparent perspective, which I think is why I focus on bringing people on my podcast who have failed. Because yes, it's very difficult. Uh, but thrilling, right? I mean, I made my first dollar on the internet. It's kind of crazy that people would yeah. buy something for me. And uh, it's just a different feeling. So it was successful in that I sold it and I built it. Uh, but lots of learning lessons along the way, which I think is the goal as a maker. It's never going to mm -hmm. be the thing the first time it's the thing. So you just have to take all that feedback and learn how to make the next thing a little bit better and, until you get there. So I have a question with you regarding like makers that don't necessarily want to market. I've been mm -hmm. seeing more and more people talking about building product studios and then mm -hmm. potentially selling their products to people who mm -hmm. want to market and sell them. Yep. Um, what's your opinion on this? I think it's great for some people. I think there are a ton of people that are fantastic makers that have really brilliant ideas and don't have an interest or desire or comfort to market and kind of sell it. And I think there's a huge opportunity there for a lot of these products to get out into the world with people who are really comfortable with that particular perspective and kind of build on them, right? A lot of these are just MVPs. You're using no code tools. We're not using developers. They're firing them off very quickly, sometimes two and three a month. And some of them won't get any traction, but some of them are really quite impressive as MVPs and, you know, definitely deserve a bit more of an audience. It's just, how do you walk that line? I, I think it's going to be a huge space in the creator economy. Mm. I definitely think they're going to succeed those marketplaces. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I've been looking at them a little bit as well. This idea that, you know, you can rather than having someone build your MVP for like, you know, upwards of 50K, you could actually just invest 
in one that's already yep. made that already has a small amount of traction for a lot less mm -hmm. and I think you know there is going to be this space where entrepreneurs come in and all of a sudden realize oh my gosh these no coders can build stuff so fast I just need a little MVP a little bit of traction I can go and raise some stuff with investment and then we can smash out the marketing and and make tons of monthly recurring revenue yeah so um yeah yeah I think they're really looking at that yeah, it's a huge space. And I think it's a great opportunity to collaborate with a lot of people who are in the indie market and have really great strengths in one area or another and like all of the same things. I think you're going to see a lot more of those co-founders as well enter into these marketplaces to maybe have a little bit of backing. And I mean, look at what happened with On Deck, right? And like all those amazing projects they just launched. That's just the tip of the iceberg. I think we're just going to see a lot more of that. Yeah, that's super excited. Um, so talk to me about some of the communities you're involved in, because I know, I don't know about everybody else, but sometimes I'm feeling a little bit of community fatigue in terms of like, there are so many different no code communities. You've mentioned Beyond Deck, which is of course a very exciting one. So which mm -hmm. communities are you involved in and why have you decided to stay involved with those communities? Yeah, so I'm very selective in the communities that I'm in, uh, like you. There are so many amazing communities, and I think the important thing is to find the ones that really resonate with you. So for me, I'm in MakerPad. Um, you know, it was the first no-code community that I joined. It's a phenomenal group of people. I really, really enjoy it. So I'm in that. I'm in uh, the Pixel Geek community, which is a Webflow-based no-code community. Again, fantastic groups of people. Launch MBA. Uh, is the other community that I'm in. And then outside of the no-code space, I'm in uh, two other groups. So I'm in Rosie Sherry's uh, Rosie Land community building mm -hmm. community, very meta. <laughs> and uh, I'm in a design community slash mentorship group with Dan Petty. Um, each of them are very, very different. None of them do the same things. Uh, there is some crossover between some folks in particular with um, Launch, Pixel Geek, and uh, MakerPad. But the interactions are totally different. And what I think is really fantastic with all these different communities is you build different relationships with different people and you know gain different things from each of them. It is difficult to keep up with so many communities and so many notifications. Um, I haven't found a great way to do it. I'll be honest, you know, between Twitter and email and multiple messages through all these different communities, it, it can sometimes feel a bit overwhelming. I try and time block <laughs> to get back to people. Um, but there's just so much value there. So I think as more and more communities emerge, the important part is to find those communities that resonate with you. And almost like you curate your Twitter feed and your content, you have to kind of curate the communities that you belong to. And I don't think mm -hmm. there's anything wrong with saying, this doesn't really serve me anymore and I support you, but it's just not for me. And I think a lot of founders are struggling with that when you know they have members that say, you know, this just isn't really for me anymore. It's natural to take that as a negative, but I think it's it's good because you want community members that are engaged and it really feels meaningful to them. That's only going to help that community grow. Yeah, we were having a really interesting conversation. So when I was chatting to Ben from MakerPad about that in terms of like what defines a community mm -hmm. and he was talking a little bit about how Slack communities, while they're known as the typical communities can be a little bit too much chat and mm -hmm. very little actual productivity. Yeah. Whereas he sees communities as more of it can be even a light touch community it's just anybody who's engaged with your brand mm -hmm. and is actually like either taking or contributing to the community as a whole you know he sees it a lot more like i suppose the webflow community which is mm -hmm. isn't necessarily run by webflow themselves in fact people love the tool so much that they've just gone off and like made their own communities related to building it you know oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and I don't know what your thoughts are on like, what, how do you define community? Like, what do you think a community is? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think I would define it pretty similar to Ben. That it's just a, a group of people sharing a like-minded interest. How and when they meet and how they connect isn't really as important as that you're on uh, the same kind of 
path in terms of interests and like-mindedness and that it's a safe, trusted space. So I think that can be multiple ways. I've found a lot of great community just by having these little one-off conversations, right? Uh, with my podcast guests, I've built a little community as I'm sure you're finding and you interact with those folks in different spaces. And sometimes it's a random DM or email, but you do feel like it's a community because you have a shared common interest. Um, so I think there's been a great push for a lot of forum based communities and a lot of chatter and Slack and Circle. And, you know, these are all great platforms and great people, but we need to broaden a bit the definition of community and look at it as, you know, we had meetup groups before the pandemic. I'm sure they'll come back. There's lots of different yeah. ways to uh, embed community without it being so forum driven and resource driven and just more about connection. It's really what I'm trying to build is just more connection based community and uh, that that trust. Yeah, and I suppose for me community is human. It's something that relies on human to human connection like it shouldn't be defined by the technology stack we build right. a community yeah. on. And I know that you are doing quite a bit of work with kind of helping the creative community in general, mm -hmm. you mentioned that your first product was related to empowering creatives and you've kind mm -hmm. of relaunched that. So do you want to share a little bit with us and the community about what you're working on at the minute? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm working on it's a, a platform called Helping Creative. So the first version was under MakerPad and I launched this video based application system. So it didn't really have to do with resumes. The problem with creative folks is a lot of times their resume does not match their skill set. They bring a lot to the table that's hard to articulate on paper and kind of overlooked, especially when they're switching careers. Um, there's a lot of great platforms that already exist out there. So I kind of scrapped that, uh, not totally, just reimagining it, and relaunched in December with Community Finder, which was, is a curated list of communities all across all different creative fields, you know, writers, no coders, indie hackers, entrepreneurs, whatever it is that you're doing in the creative space, um, you need to find that group of people that's trusted and supported. And I found it really difficult to find a spot to search for them. So I'm building mm -hmm. that out. Um, and the platform itself it really ties together with the podcast that I have. And, and I'm starting to add a newsletter so I can get in touch with folks just to talk about the the journey from a more traditional role to something non-traditional. So I consider those creative roles, they may or may not be, um, you know, really how to get from A to B. I left a corporate career of 20 years to enter into this space kind of without a community, without a plan, just figuring out as I go along and learned a lot. And the more I talk about it, the more that seems to resonate with a lot of people. And as most folks, if you're aware of me, I'm very transparent and honest. And I talk about how really difficult it is. And it's not fast. Um, you know, I didn't sell 10 copies of podcast ops and but surely 10 people in the, the, you know, anyway. So I think just being a bit more transparent about those things is really what I'm trying to build and help people connect with others along this path who either have been there or are going there and, and can kind of do it together. Okay. Great. Well, I, I think that's kind of like a really great thing to sort of reflect on. And and in terms of ending the podcast now, I think it's kind of an appropriate time. Um, yeah. So thank you so much, Sarah, for spending time with me um, and with our audience to discuss your launch node code story. Yeah, thanks for having me, Natalie. Awesome. Right. So for all of you that, that are still available on the live stream, we are now going to be opening up the floor to ask Sarah anything. So if anybody has any questions that they want to chip in, please do add them to the comments. And um, yeah, and we will get asking Sarah those questions. I know we have a couple of people out there still watching. So please don't be shy. Um, yeah. Ask, ask anything. Sarah I'm anything. an open book. <laughs> And don't worry, if they don't ask anything, I'm, I'm just going to ask you a few questions anyway. Just yeah, in case they're go nervous. for it. So, um, well, you tell me that you always talk about people's failures on uh -huh. your podcast. Um, but I suppose I want to ask you, first of all, what is your biggest failure? What was your biggest one? Yeah, um, my biggest failure. Oh, boy, there's so many. It's tough. I, I've had this question before from a couple of people. I think my biggest failure most recently has been um, podcast ops for all the reasons that I mentioned. 
not knowing how to market and not understanding really who I was targeting and that I shouldn't be building. I, I, I was building in public, but not as much as I should have been. And, and talking to early adopters was kind of a really huge failure. Um, and the other thing with that product is I just burnt myself out by taking on too much. And so <laughs> I didn't want to market it. I was done with it once I was build, done building it. Uh, so that was tricky. But I think along my journey, probably the bigger failure was not leaning into myself and trying to become someone that other people expected me to be. That has really made my journey and my story much more difficult than it needed to be. And I think a lot of people probably can understand <laughs> that if you don't lean into who you really are, you're always going to have a little bit of friction. And I wish I had kind of embraced the fact that I like to do multiple things and can do multiple things and I can figure out how to make that work instead of always listening to people say, you can't can't do it that way. You have to do it this way. Um, it's hard, For but sure. it's rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I was having a chat with my, my gramps the other day and I remember walking into his house um, for the first time in a long time because of lockdown. And um, I told him all the things that I was doing. He was like, Nally, change is as good as a rest and I was like actually do you know what like maybe that's why I enjoy doing a few different things because yeah. just changing your mindset actually allows your brain to rest on something if you spend some time doing content creation you're resting maybe your artistic brain if you then do the design stuff you're then resting your writing mm -hmm. brain and you know mm -hmm. you can actually rest by doing multiple projects at the same time you don't have to focus wholly on one thing we're not all like that so yeah great so I'm gonna ask you a much harder question um what is your greatest success mm, that's very hard for me um yeah yeah success is tough for me I think my greatest success is leaving corporate uh mm. I truly believe that if I had stayed there I would have never figured out that I could actually be fulfilled <laughs> It sounds deep, but, and I know you're looking probably for something more basic, but yeah, my, my greatest yeah. success is saying no and leaving. Well, yeah. It, I mean, I think that's an amazingly brave thing to do. There's lots of people that never manage to leave the corporate space and they continue yeah. to be in it and they will always be in it. And it won't be until they are much older before they realize that they wish they could have done it again. And it's a hard thing to do, you know, yeah. to to say I will never be in corporate ever again. And just like for me and for our audience as well. Oh, okay. So we do have, we've got a question that's come in now. So Chet Hall asked Perfect. a question related to tools. So this is an interesting one actually. So what other no code apps similar to Airtable have you used? Or I suppose if you haven't used them, have you heard about? Uh, yeah, I know about Rose. I think Rose it used to be something before it was called Rose. I haven't looked into Rose at all. Um, I mean, of course, I've used Google Sheets. I don't know if that technically counts as no code. But yeah, I don't know that there's too many that do. Um, Coda is kind of a cross between Airtable and Notion, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, a little yeah, bit. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, that's it. I truly like <laughs> use Airtable for everything. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing because it's dominated the market so much. I know there are a few competitors that are sort of coming out to it. And I suppose it depends on what can be integratable. So, for example, like yes. Stacker is now looking, they've got their beta Google Sheets integration, which means mm -hmm. that, you know, all of a sudden, all the things you have to have, use Airtable for for Stacker, you can now look at Google Docs. I know there are right. some other organizations looking at that. You're right. Coda is... is, is Coda is still trying to find its identity a little bit, I feel. Yeah, um, it's very confusing to me. I think it's a great product, but it's just oh, it's confusing when I think about what I would do with it. Like, I'm not sure where where it fits in my <laughs> stack yet, so it's yeah, not there I, yet. It's certainly worth, like, getting on the phone with some of the builders from Coda and seeing mm -hmm. what they've built, because actually they've, they've almost built, like, internal business infrastructures just on Coda, and it's actually yeah. pretty awesome. So, like, they can have, like, their accounts running, their, like, CRM running, like, all of it mm -hmm. that just feeds into each other. So I suppose I see it as a cross between Notion and Airtable wrapped into mm -hmm. one at the minute, and yeah. I know you can import Airtable bases into that. Um, yeah, 
So thanks for that, Sarah. Is there any other questions from the audience about tools? No. That was a good question. Yeah, currently not. So currently not any questions about tools, but we, we're only actually going to be on the air for another five more minutes and then we're going to be ending today because I am actually heading off to um, prep for um, for um, a chat with the co-founders of Shout Out, um, which will yeah. be in about an hour and a, I think it's an hour and a half, hour and 20 minutes will be, I'll be jumping back in for that live stream. So that will be exciting. I Shout suppose, Out's a great product. <laughs> yeah. It is. Do you use it? Unpaid plug for them. Yes. I love shout out. Yeah. It's a great yeah. product. Great founder. I have one yeah. as well. Uh -huh. yep. Yeah. I actually used it for um, a 24 seven no code challenge um, where I got everybody to list the last three tools they'd lose in the last 24 hours. And mm -hmm. then I took all of those posts and made a, a wall. I haven't actually published that anywhere yet. I need to do that. But I've... It's a great use for it. Things that you don't have published yet yes yes i have a lot uh it's good and bad that you can your shout out well listen i love shout out because when you're having a bad day just go into shout out and look at your curated feed of all the amazing things people said on you <laughs> you're like oh wow. okay today great That's it's great cool. it's great mental health booster mm -hmm. cool well, we've actually had three questions now come in so i think these will be probably oh, okay. the, the final three of of the day Perfect. so depending on how long you spend on the answers so, oh, this is a great one. Thanks, Bambi. So, if you were starting completely from zero, mm -hmm. no previous history and no code, how yep. would you recommend one to start with their no code journey or no code project, considering they just have an idea? So, someone mm. with an idea, no experience with no code what yeah, would you recommend that's, that's a great question i think there's a lot of folks in that spot so i would recommend starting with some of the resources that help you evaluate stacks if you just have an idea so michael novotny has a great one there's a couple of other people that are kind of building them out but michael's comes to mind the um I don't, I'll have to get to the link. I'll, I'll tweet it out here afterwards. <laughs> so I say it correctly, but he does a great job of you being able to put in what your uh, current skill set is and what you're hoping to do and giving you a stack of tools to use to build it out. So I think that's a great place to start. I think it's a great idea to interact with people on Twitter and chat with them uh, if they have something similar. If you have you know, a product in mind and there's something in the market that is similar to that, reach out to the person on Twitter and say, hey, how did you go about this? You know, um, Are there certain tools I should be looking at? And uh, yeah, just a lot of social listening and, and research before you kind of dive in because it's easy to go down a rabbit hole um, and get stuck while you're building and realize this wasn't the right tool. For sure. And I suppose just on the top of that, actually, that dude, Dennis and I are actually building a product called Minimal Viable Stack, which is all going to be about like what the minimum level of tools you need to build to build your yeah. MVP. So, you know, if you keep watching um, myself and that dude, Dennis, on Twitter, we are building that out, um, which is which is great. Um, next question from Chet Hall. Again, another great question. Um, what tools do you use? to collect payment? And I, there might be a few different answers here. So I'll mm -hmm. let you talk yeah. about payment. So uh, for my consulting clients, I use uh, FreshBooks, which is an invoicing system. For podcast ops, I run through Gumroad. It's super easy and they take care of everything uh, for you. Um, yeah, and that's kind of what I use right now. I know there are lots of tools that you can integrate though. When I'm building out this community, I'm going to look into, like I said before, either member space, member stack, or Outseta and kind of compare them in terms of what I need for the community. Those integrate with payment processing tools. So depending on where you're located in the world, I'm not sure if it integrates with your particular payment processing that you need. Um, Get Billflow, I know is great. That's another uh, tool you can use for payment processing. So those are the recommendations. Yeah. Yeah, I know the Get Bill Flow team are very active on Twitter. They have their own mm -hmm. Twitter spaces that they actually bring community members together to talk about that kind of stuff. So it's definitely yeah. worth looking them up there as well. Mm -hmm. And that rounds off the session to an end. So thank you so awesome. much to every well, 
Sarah, thank you. And to listeners, thank you for being there. And thank you for your questions. And thank you, Gabriel, who is our producer for hosting us today. And yeah, um, it's great to see you here. And hopefully I will see you all again in about an hour and 20 minutes for the next um, session. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>